Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our first live stream for Painting One of uh, Fall Quarter here, 2021, at Clark College. Uh, my name is Grant Hoddle. I'm the painting instructor um, and uh, current department chair of the art department. And um, if you're sitting in on this live stream, there's probably a good chance that you are in my current Painting One class. Um, I'll get you a little caught up on where we are as we start this painting today on... Uh, the right side of our stream, you can see the image of the uh, painting that we'll be, um, I'll be working on top of. This is an underpainting that I had you guys start on Monday in class, and we were using uh, burnt sienna and burnt umber uh, to make essentially a grisaille. A grisaille, uh, uh, as I mentioned a lot in class, is a, um, a neutral um, underpainting that uh, a lot of old master painters used to kind of separate out the drawing process, composition, value, proportion, perspective, all of that kind of stuff um, from the color and surface part of their painting. This meant that a lot of times they were using what's uh, what I often call an, uh, an indirect approach to painting. So rather than mixing a sp really specific color and then applying it in a la prima to the surface, they might think about the optical mixing of the back of the canvas moving forward to the front and working in transparent layers, which are sometimes called glazes. What I'll be doing today is mostly direct painting. So I'm not going to be working in glazes. I'm going to be using this underpainting as a guide, as my drawing tool, uh, to help me build the rest of the painting forward. Uh, to do that today, I'll be using a limited palette. Uh, you can see that in the... Um, description of this video, um, but I'll be using a um, burnt umber, uh, an ultramarine blue to mix a black, and I'll start, sh that is where I'll, I'll start today, is kind of showing you how to mix that black and why we think about mixing blacks. Um, next, I will uh, have burnt sienna, titanium white, yellow ochre, and then I also have available to me um, Ultra, uh, a Lazarin Crimson and Thalo Green to make an alternate black if I need to. Um, yeah, so welcome. As you start to watch, if you have any questions, uh, please type them into the chat and let me know you're here and um, I'll answer those questions as soon as I can. So, welcome. Okay, beg your pardon, I was just moving my chat over to my other screen where I have um, the image that I'll be working from that you can see in the bottom left of yours. Uh, that was a photo I took in class and um, I just wanted to have my chat in the same function where I could see it. Um, so I'm gonna start with a, this is just a piece of white, uh, glossy palette paper. Um, and I thought I'd start by just mixing uh, a little bit of my black here for you so that you can kind of see initial first steps um, for doing that. Um, this is a uh, burnt umber. You can see it's very dark brown and this is ultramarine blue. Now ultramarine blue is a lot fatter, uh, fattier of a um, paint color and uh, it's so you can see it's a lot more translucent and very very blue. Ultramarine blue is a, is a really excellent invention and before we had ultramarine blue we had a real difficult time mixing blue as painters um, there was actually a contest in France to determine a better solution to blue by the paint makers of the day than lapis lazuli um, original ultramarine blue was made with a mined semi-precious stone from Afghanistan called lapis lazuli. So blue was very, very expensive and uh, it didn't have nearly as much staying power as it once did. So what I'm doing here to start is I'm mixing a black out of my um, burnt umber and ultramarine blue. And the reason 
then I'm going to ask you to mix your black this time. And this is what I think you should start with uh, in today's lesson when you're working on your own painting. The reason that I would like you to mix your black instead of just use ivory black is it will allow you to start to control the temperature of your grays. And um, controlling temperature is the first step into becoming a particularly competent colorist. Um, so temperature is one of the main areas that you'll be thinking about in color as we get a little bit more specific into the color wheel. We'll talk about that a lot. So what I'm aiming for right now is essentially just a um, neutral black. Now you probably won't be able to tell the difference um, between a neutral and not a neutral in the screen right here. So I'll try and make it a little easier for you to see by overloading one way or the other. I have burnt umber, which is a warm color, and ultramarine blue, which is a cool color. So between those two, by adding a little extra blue to my black, I can make grays that are cool. So if you think of like something like a gunmetal gray or an icy gray, those might have a cooler tone to them. Now, if you look at the photo that I'm working with here, both the bone and the platter that it's sitting on are quite full of warm grays. Lots of uh, kind of browns and undertones of yellow that are inside them. So I'm gonna want a lot of warm grays today. Um, but if you notice that kind of satin sheet that uh, everything is sitting on is a lot cooler by comparison. And so that's an interesting way to start to use the lighter tone of blue. So in order to show you this, I'm gonna grab a little bit of white so that hopefully we can pull up a little bit of, when you, by the way, when you add white to a color while you're mixing, it's called a tint. I'll bring this up again a lot in the future when we're working with a full palette. Uh, but taking a tint of a color is, is not only useful for the purposes of, of painting, because you need lighter versions of that color, can also really help you see what it is that you're mixing. And so once I've taken a tint of this, I can see that this is still a quite warm gray. There's a little bit more brown in it than there is blue. So if I take some of that gray off to the side right here, I'll see if I can make a cooler gray for you to kind of perceive the difference of the two. Now, I don't want to use a ton of the blue because it will really overpower, <laughs> like I just did. See how blue it is now? But I'll also lighten it with white, and at least it'll showcase the difference between the two. Now, I'm, I'm mixing with a palette knife. Um, Many of you probably mix with your brush. I'll tell you some of the benefits of mixing with a palette knife. The first one being, I'm not gumming up a brush right now, right? I'm not filling a brush's bristles with paint. Um, so that's a nice, you know, it's nice on its own. It's also really good for mixing uh, larger amounts of paint and I can really kind of squish the paint down into it, kind of press and roll, press and roll is kind of the feeling, uh, is what it feels like in my hand. And I just, I like the sense of that. You can also, of course, paint with a palette knife um, if you're trying to get lots of paint on something very quickly. It's a good way to do it. So this is a much more neutral gray and placed side by side with the warm gray, I'm hoping that you can see a little bit of a distinction between those two. Uh, that one leans a little bit uh, cool and the other leans a little bit warm. And this will be what um, I'm, I'm asking you to work on. So for most paintings in the future, I'll likely ask you to mix your black. And this is why, so that you can control the temperature of the gray that you use from that point forward. Now, ivory black is still a great black. You'll use it a lot because it's a good, relatively neutral tone. And, um, and it's just a solid black. So burnt umber and ultramarine blue is particularly good at making a black that has a naturalistic feel. This is a black that I'll be using today because I'm painting um, a skull. Uh, natural still life with a, a piece of, of kind of aged uh, metal underneath it. Now, if you were painting something particularly industrial, you needed something extremely black, um, you might try what I've listed in the details of this video as the alternate black option. That is using a lazarin crimson as your warm and phthalo green as your cool. Um, those uh, together, they're a little harder to make work as your black uh, because they tend to go very purple when you, you know, mist 
miss uh, one way or the other, red or, or green. Um, but they make uh, really one of my favorite blacks, just a really, really luscious black. And, and it's uh, excellent if you're trying to do something a little bit more kind of design-based or, um, like I said, industrial. So I'm gonna go ahead and take these uh, paints that I've mixed here off of this makeshift palette, put them back on my palette over here, and start working a little bit on the actual painting that I planned. So obviously you can't see my palette today um, because I only have one extra camera. Uh, but what I'm working with is um, a piece of glass set on top of a table. Um, and it's a nice way to, if, if, you're, if you're building your own space at home and you have enough room to dedicate to an actual painting studio, you might consider doing something similar yourself. And that's just getting a piece of decent tempered glass that's you know relatively thick. I think mine's about a, oh, at least an eighth of an inch, probably closer to a quarter of an inch thick. And, um, and uh, mixing it on, on that so that you can, uh, it's easy to scrape and you can maintain um, like a, a slightly more permanent place than those uh, throwaway pads that I had you guys buy for class. I still like the throwaway pads. I use them in my own studio as well, but. So the first thing that I need to do while starting this painting is kind of assess a little bit about what, what and where I'm going to build from. And uh, I know that I'm obviously gonna paint a lot on that skull today, so I'm gonna need to um, play around a little bit with finding the right tones of, of white, of light gray, light warm gray, and probably add a significant amount of um, yellow ochre to that gray because uh, I hope you all can see in the photograph that there is kind of a yellow hue applied to much of the skull. And so I kind of want to start with that. Um, I'm adding a little bit of solvent to my paint, thinning my paint just a touch, because here at the beginning, I want to have the, the control, the ability to kind of work in some little sections uh, thin, thinly. I still have a rag, of course, and uh, that rag I'll use to kind of control how much paint is on the edge of my brush. Don't forget about that. Now what I'm starting with here, I probably won't use a ton of today, but this is a bristle brush because I want to kind of loosely start to scrub in some of the surface. Now these first couple moves that I make will be really kind of sloppy and just about blocking in and thinking a little bit about where I'm going with some of my value. I'll also notice um, in my own line of vision when something looks too cool um, please be aware that sometimes because I'm painting on top of this really strong warm orange burnt sienna surface some of the initial colors that I'm gonna throw in there might feel a little um, overly um, cool at first like really blue you can take an almost a totally neutral gray and on this space they're gonna feel awkwardly So right here, I just want to get a little bit of tone on the painting itself. Generally, when I'm first blocking in color, I prefer to do most of my mixing on the palette and not on the surface of the painting. And the reason for that is pretty simple, actually. Um, I want to be a little bit more accurate 
and I want to control what's on what's going on to the painting first, and then I can start to build uh, a little bit of blends here and there as I need to. So you might see me throw something down and then almost immediately start to change it. And that's probably because as soon as I got it on the surface, I was like, oh, that's wrong. You know, I made a mistake. I'm also gonna be exaggerating a little bit some of the tones that you can see in that photograph. Because I took the photograph when all the lights were on in the um, classroom, there's a real kind of flatness to the tonal quality across the surface. And I'm gonna probably play that up a little bit. I'm gonna want it to feel a little bit more dramatic. So I'll probably be kind of offsetting some of that with a little bit of extra darkness and lightness at various points. So right here, I'm kind of making a few different moves happen at the same time. I'm using uh, a little bit of burnt sienna and yellow ochre with a touch of white and some of that black that I mixed up earlier to make this kind of darker than medium, um, very warm tone that I'm just kind of scrubbing into some of the shaded areas that I want Um, now, I think Deborah in class yesterday or on Monday asked me how much of the underpainting or if we would leave parts of the underpainting visible. And the answer is basically yes, as you like. Um, you can leave sections of the underpainting visible to um, your viewer. And that can either be like maybe I'd leave a whole section rough uh, to the side of the, of the skull. Or perhaps I would actually just use a section of the skull, um, I'm sorry, leave a little bit of, of burnt sienna rolling from the underside of something. Both are acceptable. I want you to kind of experiment and play with what your ideas uh, are and see how they start to take you as you work. And right now, I, I'm really just kind of feeling my way around this. Um, I'm not fully committed to anything I'm doing yet. Um, I just mostly want to kind of start making decisions about where my lights and darks go and start establishing a color system that I'll be able to use as I, as I slowly decide what done looks like. I will get more detailed as I go, but here at the start, I'm just trying to kind of sketch some things in and start to lay in a little bit more paint and build towards that. So I mentioned before that this is a limited palette um, and we haven't talked very much about color theory in this class yet. We will. Um, so some of the things that you're going to want to think a little bit about um, are primary colors. Um, if this was open in the class, I would ask you, what are the primary colors? You know, what, what are your colors do you consider primary in a normal color wheel? And 
In a painter's color wheel, those are traditionally red, yellow, and blue. These are the colors from which all other colors are mixed and which you yourself can't mix by combining two other colors. That's what makes them primary. If you mix them together, blue and yellow become green. Uh, that's a secondary. Red and yellow become orange and so on. So in this instance, what we're thinking of is we're thinking of um, our primaries, our red as being burnt sienna, our yellow as being yellow ochre, and our blue, of course, is ultramarine blue. And so between those, I'm mixing all of my other tones out of that set. Now, because those are all very naturalistic colors and fairly subdued compared to something like cadmium red, which I also had you buy, or um, anything like that, then you're going to have a little bit more control essentially over um, your color bases not being kind of overwhelming to your um, rest of your of your painting. So it's a good way to work. Um, it's obviously hard to talk and paint at the same time. I'm struggling. So at this stage, I hope you can tell that I'm still simply blocking things in, thinking about big areas of temperature and value. So is it darker or lighter than the area next to it? Is it warmer or cooler than the area next to it? And that's really all I'm working with right this second. You know, I don't want uh, to, to Soon, I will get more detail in there, but I want these things to feel loose right now so that I can control and decide when to go a little heavier. If you have any questions or concerns, please don't forget to ask them in the chat. We'll help to have some idea of what you're thinking while I work on this so that I can kind of start to develop a sense of where you're at as a class. What parts of this make some sense to you and what parts feel really unnecessary or, you know, if you're curious about why something looks the way it does at this stage, all of that can be very helpful.
So Emily says in the chat, um, the hardest part of painting for me is being okay with it not being perfect the first time around. Well, Emily, I hope you can see that this is far from perfect, right? This is some sloppy shit. Um, so, you know, what I'm trying to do right now, you have to remember as you work, I think, or try and get yourself to, to, to believe and, and, and remember that as you work, it's, I'm working towards a level of finish, right? I'm going to get it there. But at the start, what I'm trying to find is um, a consistency, uh, kind of almost every time I sit down to paint, especially from observation, it's almost like reteaching myself how to do it, even if I've just done it. And um, I'm sure that some of you feel that way too. And, and so this is why it's like, it's important to just keep at it and to give yourself the space and the slack that's required to build up enough um, of a surface. And also remember that the nice thing about painting, as you've heard me say many times, is of course that you can paint over it, but also that the more that you paint over it, typically the more interesting your surface is. So sometimes when you see like a really fantastic painting that, you know, really knocks your socks off, a lot of times the difference between that and the amateur painting that kind of looks good from a distance but doesn't hold its own up close is the fact that someone who painted it, uh, the, the, the professional, painted it multiple times in multiple ways so that it built up a surface. And I just want to point out that like when you, if you know, if you're not feeling it after, you know, 30 minutes or 40 minutes of painting, you can always scrape that surface down and start to rework it. I do that a lot and it helps. I mean, to be honest, I might do it after our lesson today and scrape it down and just have another station to start from. It depends on how I'm going to feel about this at the end of class. Um, like, do I think that the painting is coming along well enough to like actually work or is it so sloppy that it's got, you know, far too much left to be, you know, to do. Whoops. Okay, so there you go. <laughs> Sometimes you just grab the wrong, you know, get distracted. So that happens. You just grab and scrape. It's no big deal. Push that black out of the way. Scrape a little of the excess off and start to work that dark into this area that I kind of wanted in the first place to be a little darker. try and make some big moves. I feel like I'm painting kind of timidly. I don't like that. So I'm going to try and block in some color in some other places. Make this thing start to feel a little closer to something. You guys are probably getting a lot of overflow in my recording from my fiance Ashley upstairs. We both work from home, of course, on these days, and she has some meetings and stuff too. So apologies for a erratic.
One thing that's important to remind yourself while painting or drawing is a phrase that I say often and that to myself. And that's that every mark has a perspective, right? So every time I put a new brush stroke that's meant to be, you know, visible in the final painting down on the canvas, I want it to be, I want to be thinking about where it, how it works with the space, the direction of the image itself. I'm working with three different brushes. I have two softs, one for a medium, like two soft nylons, one for a medium dark, and one for a pretty light uh, tone. And then I have this, this thicker bristle brush that I keep coming back to for kind of sloppier areas and bigger areas. And it's mostly loaded with dark right now, but I, I will scrape it out and use it again as needed. So, Juan Carlos figured something out on his painting uh, that we were looking at last class that you could really use positives, or I'm sorry, negative spaces to help draw in the correct positive space. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm kind of shaving down elements of the skull that are a little out of proportion. You know, as I notice I've made something and that, that might have been, you know, bad drawing in my initial one in class. It might have been that my position standing there at the easel last class is, is pretty different than my photograph that I'm working from now um, but however it is I'm trying to start to correct that right now right Now I think a lot about the way that you want your, your style to develop. You know, if you like a painterly approach, um, you know, if you ask yourself like, yeah, I like, you know, Titian, the way that Titian paints. If you don't know Titian, you should check him out. Uh, Venetian painter, uh, late Renaissance. Um, he's a very painterly painter, particularly late work Titian and I freaking love him he's great and um, so I tend to like a heavier brush stroke than say for instance uh, my colleague Eric Wirt who I've showed y'all some of his very intricate paintings um, of spilled flower vases and the like now Eric maintains a very very delicate brush stroke he's hiding the brush stroke most of the time so he's not going to just attack a canvas willy-nilly the way that I am like to me, there's not a lot of loss in a brush stroke that gets covered up, but is still somewhat present. Uh, to him, that might muck up, you know, part of his surface that he's trying to build up, and and it might, you know, not actually lead to the end result that he's looking for. So a lot is going to depend at any given moment for you as a painter on what on what your goals are, and and that can be a tricky thing to realize when you're first starting out because it feels like you know how I paint is just how I paint right this is my style or this is my technique and, and everything I do looks like I did it 
Uh, but the longer that you develop as an artist, the more you realize that you can control, like you can paint different ways. I paint very different ways. I'm mostly an abstract painter. Um, although I've started working a little bit more frequently with um, um, representation again. Uh, but I also, like if you've seen the faculty show uh, that's up right now on archergallery.space, um, make a lot of illustrations. And that's not really a part of my professional practice as much, but it's a, it's a part of my, um, it's a part of, like, it's just one of the things that I really love to do. So um, my point is that I have taught myself a lot of different ways of working. And I try and use the one that makes the most sense for whatever it is I'm trying to accomplish at the time, right? Not necessarily just thinking like, well, how do I fit this into my already existing skill set? But more like, how do I make a decision that will help make the painting look a way that I want it to look, right? And that's why one of the reasons I'm showing you this technique, this Grisaille or Brunei technique in the first place, is so that you can decide if you'd like to make your paintings have a little bit more old-fashioned feel. I think a lot of people are interested in that, and it feels like somehow out of reach. And I'm trying to show you that it's not. You just have to try and build it the same way they built it. You know, because that's the thing. It's, you're, you know, you're building a painting. It's not being, it's not coming out of nowhere, right? It's coming out of a series of decisions that you're making as you work. So I'm hoping that some of the decisions that I made early on are starting to become apparent as to where they're headed as I work, as I start to kind of smooth things out and reapply value. And yes, do some blending and kind of establish the direction that I'm hoping this goes the longer that I work on it. For today, I will probably paint for another, for our, you know, video for another half hour or so. Um, and hopefully in that time, I'll get enough locked in that you can kind of see where it might continue. And I, I, I'm hoping, I'm hopeful that I'll have some time later today to do some more painting on it and, and show you all a photo on canvas of, of where it's going after, you know, maybe another couple of hours of work. Um, but when I talk to you about, yeah, painting takes time, you know, it, it does. You have to build things up. You have to work kind of slowly sometimes. And um, that means that you have to grant yourself the amount of time required to make the thing that you want to make. And if you and, and that's that requires a commitment of saying, OK, you know, today, tomorrow and Friday or whatever, I'm, I'm painting. Um, and I know that that means balancing the rest of your work life, family life against that. But do yourself that favor. You know, you're taking a painting class. Um, I hope you'll consider taking painting two with me in the spring. That'll be fun. Uh, we'll be working a lot in abstraction there. But, you know, for many of you, this might be the only time in your life that you really decide to sit down and try and paint. And um, if that's the case, give yourself the time to do it. You know, say, hey, you know what? I'm going to try and do this today. And I'm going to try and do this this week. And as I work on it, it's going to become something that I enjoy. So one of the reasons I love painting bones is because the, the like endless variations of light and dark that kind of pop up across the surface work really well for... the way that I like to build paint on top of itself so that I can put kind of a messy mark right next to something and then work back on top of it and it starts to almost feel a bit more like bone. Um, so hopefully you're, you're able to start to see that a bit on there. Any other questions? Thanks Emily for your comment there too.
hopeful that you can kind of tell where which direction this is going. It's uh, I admit that COVID has made something happen where I've you know I've, as a, as a as a teacher I've always done you know demos for my classes and my students um, in class, but there's still a large part of my painting process that is you know not usually right in front of everybody, um, and uh, so it's 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 tricky to be in this position where I'm like, I don't really know if you're getting much out of some of these decisions I'm making because you can't be in my head. So I'm trying to let you in on some of the decisions that I'm making as I work and that that, and hope, hoping that that will inform you. I'm also just trusting that, you know, hopefully you watching me make, you know, ugly decisions, like bad moves will encourage you to be like, Hey, that's not so bad. Grant really screwed that up and then made it look okay at the end. So I'll try and do the same thing to mine. Um, I'm really hesitant about the sense that a lot of beginning painters have that they have to get everything in the right order right away. And if they don't, it's going to like, you know, turn out badly. I want you to feel like you can get in there and push paint around and mess something up and fix it. That's how you're going to get better at this game. You learn more by botching something than you do by getting it right the very first time. I think that relatively speaking, it's pretty easy to make like a fresh looking painting or drawing, you know, like, you can go in and you can make like a couple of really big bold moves and kind of throw some stuff on there and it's 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 relatively easy and if you're trying to build something a little bit more refined um, and take your time with it I think it's a little trickier sometimes not always so I'm not doing too much like detailed work yet in terms of like there's a lot of surface detail on this skull that I'm I'm still at this point pretty much just ignoring like I don't want to spend a ton of time like working on um, little cracks in the surface of the skull or even my highlights yet you can probably tell that I've pushed most of those off I want those to come a little later after I have really feel like I've established the correct value and temperature for most of the forms in the skull and then I'll take the time to go in and block in some you know do a little line work do a little you know things here and there to kind of refine and push that so one thing I haven't done yet and I'm gonna do this quickly is stand up look at my painting from a step back Okay, so I see that that left eye is a little on the small side, uh, left eye socket. So I think I need to push this up a little bit, um, just a touch, and maybe counter that by pushing this down a little bit so that there's kind of a little bit of a mixture going on in both spaces. So I think it's important, don't forget, to from time to time get some distance from your work, even if you're feeling you know, pretty good about where things are going. So I'm just gonna raise that up a touch. Not a lot. Eighth of an inch ought to do quite a bit because on the other side, I will bring this little shadow right here. So a couple things that you might find useful to note. Um, I'm still getting, I'm using a pivot point where I'm putting a, a one pinky down on the surface to give myself a little bit of control anytime I'm doing something small. But additional to that is, you know, 
you might have a little bit of shake in your hand and it's important to take breaths. So just like, um, oh, I don't know if you, if you like to go to the, if you like to hunt, I know some of you are probably hunters. Um, you go to the gun range and you're practicing, um, you know, you take a couple of deep breaths, you try not to hold your breath. Don't forget to, to breathe. And that will go a long way towards just keeping your hand from shaking too much. And you can kind of work in a tight little space, you know, without botching it. So let's see, where do I like some things? I like some of the brightness in here. That's looking pretty good. I like the way that, that this is starting to shape up. I need a little bit more sense of highlight on this eye socket right here. of this highlight and kind of waiting on so when it comes to highlights I, I don't always treat them the exact same um, you're probably getting sick of me saying that, that that like oh it always depends it always depends what are you trying to do with it um, but generally speaking I like to get kind of a soft lightness where I want the highlight first and then work up to the bigger areas of, of really bold bright. I don't go straight into, you know, pure white. I like to build like, cause I want it to kind of glow a little bit. So I try and get the, the like sideways light of it first. So like kind of area around the glow around the reflection first. So you can kind of see me working that in on this, on this top line here. And then then uh, once I have that and I feel pretty good about it, then I'll come back in and tap in a few of the key little areas that are gonna you know, really look like reflection. Now, in order for them to seem particularly bright, you have to have a little bit of darkness next to them. So I'm gonna kind of remix a little bit of this grayish, yellowish color and work it right up next to some of the areas that I want to feel particularly bright right there. Soften that a touch outside. Just using the tip of the brush to kind of push the paint around a little bit, soften it, drag that around a little bit. And I'm looking at the photograph, but I'm not making decisions entirely based on like, oh, it looks exactly like this in the photograph, so this is exactly how I'm gonna paint it. You know, it's like I said in class the other day, like, you know, ultimately no one other than you and me is, is likely to ever see this photograph. You know, if I ever show this painting, um, they're just gonna see the painting. And so what's way more important than that it looks like the photograph I'm working from is that it looks like a good painting, that, that I made decisions in the painting surface that were the right decisions and that made sense. And so that's the, the this, this, what I'm going to judge it on. Is it working as a painting? Not is it working as a representation of a photograph, which is already a representation of a thing that exists in real life. So like, you know, I don't really care. I don't want it to look like a photograph, right? I want it to look like a painting. I think it's probably time to make a few big decisions on the overall painting before I start to let you guys go um, and move on to the next thing. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Um, those of you who are watching this as a recording later on, um, please don't hesitate to ask any questions that you wish you would ask 
in person from via email. Uh, I think it'll help a lot of folks to to uh, let this be a little bit of an instructive uh, forum, whereas you kind of figure out how you're painting your your version of this. Um, and hopefully you've kind of thought a little bit about what you're setting up, if you're changing what you did in class, which I think many of you planned to not work from something from class, but instead to set up your own still life at home. And I think that that's a cool idea. I'm, I'm really excited to see what objects you choose you know, to paint. So big flat areas like this triangle of darkness, um, I don't think will work very great as a painting if it's just a big flat shape. So what I will probably do is um, work a little bit of that, like scrub it so that I can see a little bit of the underpainting through it in a few places and trust that since it's in the background, uh, that it's secondary to my skull and my, my real objects of, of import that uh, it won't be um, quite as necessary to, 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 to be really, you know, accurate or something like that. And I'll be able to just kind of let it function as a, as kind of an airy space, something that does its, that holds its own and is kind of a design element in the, in the, in the painting. That's what I put it there for when I set up the still life in the first place was to think a little bit more about like what, what is it doing? And, you know, I just wanted something dark and angular behind the skull, which was round and light. So um, I don't really care if it, <laughs> if it looks like a wood block, right? I care that it, that it feels like a, like a shape that, that, that creates interest in the rest of the space that I'm working from. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, I appreciate it. Have a good one.
So it's been right at about an hour since I started today. I'm gonna paint for another eh, few minutes uh, with the stream on, with the live stream on. And then, uh, but you're welcome to take off if you need to. And uh, please just um, let me know if you have any questions as you work. And uh, hopefully I'm, you know, we'll, we'll see some really good progress this week. Um, don't put this off until next week. You know, get started on it this week. And, and that way you can have some, some time to let some things dry and, and to work back into them as you need to, instead of being kind of stuck in this position where you're like, oh man, I gotta get everything done in you know, two days or whatever, because that's all I've got given myself. You wanna have you know, probably at least seven or eight days of, 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 of work time, even if it's just for a couple of hours on one day, will go a lot longer in kind of building up your your surface and, and getting you to a position where you like what's happening in your painting. So give yourself the time, give yourself the space to make to make some art. It's what you're here for. It's why you're doing this. Have some fun with it. I'd say that where I'm at in this painting is just starting to get enough paint on the surface and and fun starting to happen that I'm, I'm like looking forward to the next steps of the painting now. You know, I, I think it takes a while to get there at the, at the initial spe, you know, space. You're just kind of like, you know, blocking things in and pushing, you know, trying to get enough paint on the surface to have something to do with it.
Okay, guys, I think this will probably do it for today's lesson. Um, I'm really hopeful that I'll be able to have some time to paint on this some more. Uh, if not today, then, then this week and, and build this up a little bit more for you guys and get you to a place where hopefully you can see a little bit better how I would go about refining a piece. Um, and uh, I'm really hesitant to stop painting. I'm having fun now, but, um, you know, life. So um, I appreciate everyone who joined me this morning. Uh, I hope that you got something out of it and that you are excited to tackle your own project in class. And uh, I will see you all on Monday. In the meantime, please get started on this painting. Post uh, an in-progress shot of it. Let us see what you've been up to. And um, thanks so much, guys. Y'all have a great uh, rest of your week. Stay safe out there. Until next time.